of Treetop Development, and Joe, you're, you're a portfolio manager. That's correct. And it's about a thousand units you're managing, and they're in Queens and New Jersey. That's correct. So Joe has graciously agreed to come on today and discuss emergency electric generators for multifamily buildings. My pleasure. Now this, at first blush, might not sound like the world's sexiest topic, emergency electric generators, but when you need an emergency electric generator, it is the most important topic in the world. So I'm gonna let you take it away on the story, but 96 units, hot July night, Con Ed shuts you down for the next three months. Take it away. All right. So we were doing a J51. Okay. Um, and we were doing upgrading electric. When you upgrade the electric, for a J51, you have to do a new service coming in from the street into the building. Mm -hmm. New meter banks, new risers up to the apartments, and you also have to replace GFIs in the kitchens, uh, into the bathrooms, and designated lines for an AC. So we filed for the permits. We had a licensed electrician do all the work. Um, and the work was going on for about a month or so, which means some wires were exposed, a lot of uh, apartments were broken through the lines to pulling no risers. A tenant come ho comes home, plugs in an air conditioner on a July afternoon, and... It was a weekday or a weekday? It was a weekday. Okay. And there was a spark. A short, not knowing what it is, I wasn't there, but the tenant calls the fire department either because of smelling from smoke or maybe there was a actual small little fire. And was I right, this is 96 units? That's a 96 unit okay. building in the Bronx. Okay. Um, the fire department shows up, the fire department goes ahead and they call Con Edison because it's an electrical fire. So they show up and there's nothing going on, there's no fire, but because there's exposed wiring and because we're doing I the work. I thought also the Department of Emergency Management was there too. That was the second part. Okay, okay, sorry. Yeah, right. that, we're getting there. All right. So they show up and they see the exposed, the wiring is exposed and we do a new service. So Con Ed says, okay, you're doing electric. Maybe your electrician, while he was running new wires, crossed over, did something, and it's feeding back to the service to the street. So we're gonna protect our equipment and we're gonna shut down the service from the street going into the building. So whatever's going on into the building, whatever miswiring, it's not gonna affect the main equipment. That's where the emergency management shows up because now we have a 96 unit building, no power. And, and, and how many stories? It's six. Okay, so there's an elevator. That is correct, right. So, the, I mean, but no elevators when there's no power. Right. So that's when the emergency management shows up uh, office emergency by the mayor's office shows up because we have to eva evacuate the building. My super calls me, it was about 8 o'clock at that time. This was going on probably one or two hours prior. Um, come down here, we have a problem. So I go down there and they explain to me what they want me to do. You have to relocate all these people to a hotel <laughs> because they cannot live in the building. 96 whatever. families. 96 families, which, you know, which doubles and triples and with families and kids and elderly and so on and so forth. Um, of course, I'm freaking out. This never happened to me before. I don't know what to do, but as talking to the liaison... And let me just ask you this. It never happened to you before, but this could happen to anybody. This could happen at any time, at any moment, to anybody that's doing special this type of work. I mean, in general, if you have a, a, a fire or an electrical short, it shouldn't go to this extent. But because, like I said, we were doing the work and the wires were open mm -hmm. and exposed, kind of wanted nothing to do with it and they weren't going to get involved, so they, it was easier for them to shut this thing down from the outside and say, you right. deal with it on your own. Um, so this is going on 12, 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night, uh, and they also know they can't even find hotels for these type, for 96 units. It means they have to scatter them around in the neighborhood. So that worked in my favor, and one of the liaisons of the, of the mayor's office said, you have to hire, uh, if they use the name of fire warden or a fire guard, which means that you'll have to have a guy walking around the building with flashlights, with a cell phone in case of an emergency, in case someone needs to walk down the stairs. If you mean all night? All night, okay. because there's no power and it's dark. And, they, and I'm gonna guess whoever offers those services doesn't offer them cheap. They gave me a number who to call, because I also, like I said, I, don't, I didn't even know how, how to go about it. And they made sure to have three or four on each floor, more, it was on each floor, I'm sorry, six. So on every floor, if somebody calls fire or somebody yells help, you can get mm -hmm. to that. So I get, we get through the night. By the next morning, uh, 7 o'clock, I'm on the phone I'm with the electrician, and we tell him what's going on. And the electrician actually that suggested says, if you can get a generator, we can power back up the building because the fact that we were doing the wiring, and all the wiring is exposed, and we have open lines, it will make it a lot easier. Go find a generator. Those we're talking, like I said before, between 2005, 2006. We have the phones then, no smartphones. Right. No, 
yellow pages, start calling numbers. Generators are us. Exactly, right. or something like right. that. And we call it rent generators, what size generator? Uh, the power of 96 unit <laughs> building. My electrician gave me the, the wattage, what I'm looking for. And like, no, we can rent you to hook up a saw saw or a... Uh, <laughs> right. um, we ended up finding a company out of Connecticut and they were able to, they have these machines, the generators available, gets delivered by truck. So these are the thing, things that sit on the sidewalk like a trailer and they hum and they're scary and they have tentacles coming out of them? That's exactly okay. what it looks like. Um, they showed up. And there must be, you must have to get a permit or what do you do? We did not get a permit. Um, the only problems we had afterwards was the, depart the traffic department because we parked it on the street. <laughs> And so you got tickets? We got a lot of tickets for them mm -hmm. for not having a permit. And maybe today they do have a system for it, but we did not have that problem. And it's running on what? Gas, It's running on, ga on oil. Oil. On oil. So So you need to get oil delivered daily? Absolutely. Oh, that's we were able to get an extension. We got on a tank which hold about 150 to 200 gallons. But all this, the rental, the installation, the, the, the oil, it was still cheaper than 96 hotel rooms plus for three months. Absolutely. For for dollars for dollars dollar for dollar, it was a lot cheaper. Um, Did insurance cover any of this? No, okay. um, because it was blamed on the electrician. Mm. Um, he didn't take the call. He didn't take he didn't take responsibility for it. Um, but he was actually great help hooking it up. Um, by the end of the day, by five o'clock in the afternoon, they gave us an ultimatum. They said like by six o'clock, the city of New oh, York wow. gave us an ultimatum by six o'clock in the afternoon. If you don't have this building up and running, according to what I wanted to do. We'll evacuate the building if you like it or not. Um, so you get an hour. Exactly. But by five o'clock we were done. Okay. Um, and like I said, all the, the company rent us all the gave us all the wiring, and it was fairly easy once once he got there. The electrician had his crew there running the wires into the building, into the meter banks, um, and it was up and running. And for about three months it ran on gas, on oil, everyday delivery, about 150 gallons a day. Um, our oil company that would deliver for the for the for the boilers and for the hot water was coming every day filling it up, um, which they didn't. It wasn't cheap, but they did what they had to do. Now, I just think this is such valuable information because I think a lot of people in your position, if the city's standing there saying evacuate the building, and you don't even know you have this option, much less that it's actually. I think the message I'm taking today is it's doable. It has a, Even it has in a, a multifamily 100 unit building, you can put a generator and you could do it in about 24 hours. And this is in 2005, you're saying. Right. So. Even today, and I'm sure today, especially with Hurricane Sandy, after what right. happened in the city, buildings today, they build buildings with generators and it's probably a lot easier, a lot, a lot you know, accessible to companies, maybe local companies have that. And just to touch on the topic about mobile steam boilers, which is the same idea. Mm. You can have a breakdown in a boiler, but right now we're talking in March and it's freezing. You can have a breakdown in a boiler and right. if you don't have it up and running in a couple of hours, you'll have the city there, Department of Buildings, every agency against you, stacking up against you to do something about it. And there's quite a few companies in New York City that do that. They are the big trailers with the mm -hmm. hoses and the vents. And I'm sure that's, a, yeah, probably got to get permits to the DEP, Department of Buildings. But um, it's doable as well. Um, so the message, like you said, the message you take home is things could happen. You might not know about it. You don't have to make the phone call and say, do you have available generators? But these type of things could help you in the future and make it happen and not to get lost when something like that happens to you. Thank you so much, Joe. It's very valuable information. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Okay, so today's teaching segment is part two on tips for having a better landlord and tenant trial. And you know, I just want to say this, I'm a lawyer and I'm talking to you often about legally type things, but the theory behind this is, is that the more educated you are and the more tools that you know that are out there and available, the better you will be able as a manager or a landlord to work with your lawyer or proceed pro se. So let's um, start with trial subpoenas. So there is something called a trial subpoena. If there is someone that you want in court to testify, let's say it's a non-primary residence case and there's someone out there that you think helps support the landlord's assertion that the apartment is not used as the tenant's primary residence. Um, let's say maybe it's a super. Now, if it was your super, you could just say, hey, you're going to court today. But let's say it's a, a, it's a building employee that no longer works for you. Anybody out there, uh, imagine any scenario when you would like to have them come to court and testify, but you can't necessarily 
count on them being there, or even you're a little bit unsure they might be there, you do a trial subpoena, which is a document that says you need to be in court to give testimony on this date at this time in this place. It's served just like a summons and complaint or a notice of petition and petition. Also, judges' rules. Every judge has a set of rules that go with that judge and they post them online. It's really, really important and very good practice to read the judge's rules before you walk in for the trial because that might just be the judge that, ha that you know, says that I only want my trials to go uh, with people to submit documents on pink paper. Whatever it might be, you just want to know and seem educated about how that judge does things and that judge's part. Okay, orders and stipulations. Now, this is very important. You might have a case that had motion practice in it, and the motion practice might have resulted in some orders that are important. For instance, if the landlord did a motion to strike some of the tenant's affirmative defenses and counterclaims and some got stricken, you want the document, the order, so that you can show the trial judge that this is what has happened in the case. You might have had an earlier stipulation where a tenant, in exchange for vacating a default, you waived jurisdictional defenses, you waived traverse. That's an important milestone in that case. And you want to just have a little stack of your orders and stipulations, everything that is the controlling law of that case, you want to march into the trial judge with that. Um, and finally, affidavits submitted earlier in the case. So if you did have that motion practice back in the resolution part, if you did have that motion practice, the tenant will have put in an affidavit in support of their motion where they say, I'm the tenant, I'm fully familiar with the facts, and here are the facts. And then they, it gets notarized and they swear to it. That's an important document because that's testimony, that's earlier testimony in this case. And now you're in court. So let's say it's non-primary residence and the tenant says, no, 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 that Florida home, I'm only there in June and July. That's what they said in their affidavit. But now you're in court and the tenant gets up on the stand and, and says, no, no, that Florida house, I'm only there in December and November. Well, that's different. So, and you'd be surprised how often tenants forget what they said in the affidavit that supports their motion. And I think this might be because um, sometimes counsel doesn't communicate well with the, with the tenant and maybe that the, the documents aren't so accurate. I'm not sure why, but the point is if you have a piece of testimony that the tenant has done earlier in the case, you want that at your counsel table on the day of the trial. And those are today's tips.